Hello YouTube. So today, Rahu and Ketu in the 12 houses, which is perhaps slightly surprising. I was a bit surprised to see it get included in the book. Usually Rahu and Ketu don't get that kind of a treatment. And then also I was kind of surprised with the content itself. And I'll mention to you why it, right now. Not because it's doomy and gloomy, because we know about that. But because it, he didn't take, he doesn't seem to take into account the fact that K2 is always seven houses away from Rao. So if you got a situation, for example, I see I already did the colors. So for example, he, he likes Rao in the 11th. Or in the third, or in the sixth, which is simple. We know by now. We know that. We expect that, kind of. But he doesn't give complementary or corresponding interpretations to K two in the opposite house. So since Rahu is good in the eleventh, you might expect K two would be good in the fifth, but he doesn't like it. So it's, that's weird. So there's a couple of um, there's a couple of interesting points. Point one, it's kind of odd that he includes Rahu Ketu here in the text, usually in the classic books they don't. The second point is he treats Rahu Ketu as though they were malefics in terms of how they deal with the houses. But elsewhere he didn't define them as malefics in the like third chapter or second chapter wherever he talked about planets he said that they were not he, he didn't include them in the list of malefics uh, and then the third weird point is he doesn't link the two he doesn't link K2 to Rahu so that when he interprets Rahu in the seventh house it's consistent with K2 in, in the first Okay, now I have a solution to that problem, but I think I will save it for a bit. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. See what he says. So, okay, so for example, what about this thing about doom and gloom? That, hopefully, unless this is your first time here, you're already comfortable with that. You should already be comfortable with the fact that the colors that you buy from the art supply shop are overly bright. And the reason why you're comfortable with that is because you know that you're going to mix them. With other, you're going to mix them with each other to make them muted and changed when, when you actually use them. You should be comfortable with the fact that the spices that you buy from the grocery store or the spice store don't taste good by themselves. And the reason why you're comfortable with that is because you know that you cook them and mix them with other stuff. Right? In the same way, an interpretation of a planet and, and a sign in a classical book, the difference between a classical book and a modern book is that modern book books are meant for everyday readers because everyone is literate and there's uh, massive mass production of printing right but the classic books are very different they're not meant to be read by everyone there's very few people who are literate the people who are literate are very experienced and the books can't be mass produced very easily either so the difference between classical books and regular books is that regular books are written so that everybody would understand them. Classical books are written so that the expert would understand it. So these descriptions of a planet and a house, a planet and a sign, a planet with this aspect, a planet and this yoga, they're very drastic. Because the author has complete confidence that the person reading it knows exactly how to do astrology. I can, they, I can hand you 
unmixed spices if I'm confident that you know how to cook. But if I'm not confident, I better give you a pre-mixed masala. Or better yet, if you don't know how to, if I'm not confident you know how to cook at all, I better give you a frozen dinner. All you got to do is warm it up. Gets ready-made sag paneer. You don't need to not cook Indian at all. You need to do is boil water. So modern books are like those pre-made meals that you just stick in boiled water, and classical books are like the actual ingredients. So just you know, be aware of that. Don't think these people are crazy. They they don't understand. They're not sophisticated. They're not. They think everything is black and white. No, they know everything is sophisticated and gradiated and everything, and they expect you to know. That the we the way that you get a gradation is by mixing white and black, not by obliterating white and black. So don't be scared of black and white descriptions of things or polarized descriptions of things. Understand that the responsibility is on your shoulders to know how to mix it. So, enough said. Yep, space bug said. New Age astrology is basically ramen. Well, I'm getting frustrated with the connection here. I am going to... I'm going to quickly... Reconnect. Disconnect and reconnect. Reconnecting is successful. We're connected. Hopefully this one, this side is better. But now you have a cruddy microphone, one second. Now you have a good microphone that's way too loud. Hello. Check. Okay. Thank you for all the birthday, happy birthdays. My birthday is tomorrow, but I guess this is close enough. Thank you so much. The cool thing is that the whole year I already thought I was 52. So now that my birthday comes and I turn 52, I feel like I got a rebate. For some reason I already thought I was 52. Telling everybody I'm 52 for the last six months. All right. Um, now we can get to it. What up? Um, Rahu in the first house. Lugne. Lagne Havachirayur Artabalvan Urdvanga Rogan Vitas. So he says, I'm putting these in quotes because they're difficult to translate, and I need, I feel like I need to translate it kind of literally so you get the connotation. All of a long life, wealth and strength, and brain disease. All right, if Rahu is in the first house, he's got this. A uh, ava chirayur. So let's just examine that word, and then we'll understand the imagery that he's using. Ayur is your lifespan. First house, obvious, right? It has to do with your physical body, your your life, your physical health. If Rahu is there, then you probably have chirayur. Chira means long. So you'll probably have a long life. Why? How does that make sense? Because Rahu is the magnifier. That's brought the, the way that Rahu works is that it amplifies and it magnifies. And usually, therefore, imbalances. And it makes ex excess. So it's amplifying and magnifying the first house. That means you probably have a lot of body. In other words, it probably means you have a long life. However... He adds another prefix onto it, ava, ava chirayur. Or he adds a prefix to the compound, ava chirayur. Ava means it will drop down. So the fall of a long life. So the, what the wording is suggesting is that Rahu, it's actually the reason why I wanted to go into detail on this is because this explains exactly what Rahu does. Rahu amplifies. And by amplifying, destabilizes or unbalances. So it's like if you increase 
a house of cards enough, it becomes more likely to fall down. You make something more and more big, then it gets and it's more and more off center, then it gets more and more fallen. So that's important for understanding in general what Rahu does. It creates imbalance by creating excess. So his description is you probably what he actually practically what does it practically mean is you'll probably be healthy and strong and fine and then dead. <laughs> black and white. It's a black and white description because you are expected to mix the black and white. And so and then he just uh includes extends the compound to include the word arta and bala. Art it means the same effect is there on your money or your success, and your saint the same effect is there on your strength or your health. Okay. Good, right? This is this is actually this just this alone. If you're here for just this, it's very useful. Now you actually understand how Rahu works. And also he says Urdhvanga Rogan Vitas. Now basically what he's gonna Basically, his analysis for Rahu is it kind of sucks. And the same thing for K2. And it's kind of going to screw up everywhere it goes, with the exception of three houses. And one of the ways that he's going to say that Rahu will suck is by making you sick. And again, it's in the concept that Rahu is going to magnify, increase, inflate expand create excess of something so this is like things like tumors cancers growth growths swelling stuff like that rahu's symbolize, symbolizes those things so then just whatever whatever house it's in based this is one of the templates that he's using for the, the information that he's going to give about rahu is rahu will just cause sickness in whatever house it's in so if it's in the first house, then it's Urdvanga. Urdvanga means your head. But not just the face. The second house is the face. Third house is the neck. Uh, second house is the face and neck. Third house is like the shoulder area. Second house, third house, first house. So it's kind of the brain. It could even be hair, hair problems. Okay, and then you get, it's the same, remember Rahu's character is very well described in Avachira, in that concept. So Avachira Bala. You have very strong health, but then all of a sudden you get sick, bad. Okay, let me see, I'll check right now to see if there's any questions on topic, because at the beginning it's kind of useful to keep people pointed in the right direction but then after that we'll only go to questions at the end or at certain groups end yes with rahu you don't expect prolonged de deterioration just remember this is black and white because he's handing you the spices and expects that you know how to cook he's handing you the colors and expects that you know how to paint He's handing you black and white and expects that you understand that you have to mix them and you'll get some kind of shade of gray. Okay, we will continue. Rahu in the second, because we, we want to cover a lot. We want to cover Rahu and K2 today. Chan Noktir Mukarug Grini Narpadhani Vitte Sarosha Suki. Very interesting. So first of all, Chana Ukta. I was talking about he's handing you the spices, right? Chana means the hidden bean, the hidden thing. Chana beans are kind of hidden in the pot or something. Chana Ukta means you, you, your words are hidden. Word, hidden words. Well, these are all in quotes because I want to Share the the nuance of the word with you in the original language. Mukarug. So now he's, the disease is not in the urvanga in the brain. Now it's in the face. Grinni. Grinni is an interesting word. It means extreme, intense, fixated. 
Uh, obsessed. Obsessed. Obsessed is a better. Because literally, it, the word deals with holding things. Grin. Grin. Means to hold. Grinny. Nripadhani. Nripadhani means you're getting money from the government or financed by a king. Bitte means in the second house. Saroshasuki means you have you're happy with anger. Or you can separate the two. Excuse me. And say you're just happy and you're also angry. But that doesn't make as much sense. Or you can use one of these words as a name for Rahu and then just take it off the list. All right, hidden words, what does it mean? Well, the second house is the house for the mouth. So therefore it has to do with diet and it has to do with speech. Rahu is smoky. Rahu and Ketu are smoky or invisible. You don't see them. So Chana Ukti, the words are hidden. What does it mean? It means you're, you're hiding things by saying things. So the words are deceptive. But the way that he's got it, the way that he chose to say hidden words, chanokti means, can encompass a lot of the possible ways that it could work. It could also work where the person is really quiet. Even with Rahu in the second house. Because Rahu is invisible but magnifying. So hidden words. There's a lot of words, but they're held back. And then all of a sudden they come out. <laughs> That's another thing. So it could be deceptive speech, lying speech, manipulative speech, cover-up kind of speech. Hiding things with words. And it can also be this imbalance and sometimes quiet, sometimes loud. Same thing since it's the second house and the disease planet Rahu will cause face disease. What is a face disease? Probably skin. Grinny, obsessed, you hold on to things. Could also be a name for Rahu. Why? Because Rahu is hungry. And the second house is about eating. So wanting a lot of things, holding a lot of things, eating a lot. Nripa Dhani. Second is the house of wealth. Rahu is unstable or expansive, magnifying. So Nripadani can mean a few things. It can mean wealthy like a king. Nripadani can also mean on welfare, on social security, using the government's support. Nripadani can also mean employed by the king like a soldier or so, something like that. Or a spy. All those things can work with Rao in the second house and the way he words it lets all those things work. Run the second. Let me make a post and pin it and say questions at the end. Hello, Mystic Mama from Australia. Chintzy. I haven't heard that word in a long time. It's on you to understand how to use this spice and what kind of things it could mean. Rahu in the third. So note down your questions and ask them at the end if you are, well, actually want to ask me. Oops, yeah, why not? Rahman the third, proud or noble. Mani, Bratri Virodako, Dritamati, Shorye, Chirayur Dhani. Wow, 
He loves Rahu in the third. Are you surprised? Not really. I hope not, because he loved Mars in the third. He loved Saturn in the third. And he loved the sun in the third. Now, I remember when people in the Vedic astrology community used to actually invite me to anything or even talk to me. <laughs> and I remember hearing a lot. People would say, Shani Vat Rahu Kujavat Ketu. Which is to say, and actually, Mantreshwar is going to quote that also in the next verse after he finishes K2. It means Rahu is like Saturn and K2 is like Mars. It makes no sense. Rahu is not like Saturn at all. And Kuja is uh, hard to understand how it's like. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like Saturn and it's a little bit like Mars. What, what are they talking about? This is what they're talking about. Although they are not malefics, they are like Saturn and Mars who are malefics in terms of how they interact with the houses. They follow the pattern of malefics. The malefic pattern is good in the third, good in the sixth, good in the eleventh, maybe good in the tenth, possibly good in the ninth, not good anywhere else. That's the pattern that's true for the sun, Mars, and Saturn because those are the malefics. And it's exactly the same pattern that holds true for Rahu and Ketu. So money means you're, you have pride and it's, you're noble. You have dignity is another word. Money, dignity, pride. Radri virodhako. You defeat your peers or your siblings. Dridhamati. Dridhamati means steadfast determination. Uh, you want something and you set your mind to it and you don't give up on it. That's Dritamati. Shaurye means you're strong, you're brave, you're not scared. Uh, Shaurye, sorry, means in the third house. <laughs> that, that word bravery, strength, etc. is the name for the third house. Shaurye is in the third house. Chirayur, long life. Dani, wealth. Why wealth? Because you're going to be dedicated to, f to pursuing your ambitions from the third house. So he likes Rahu in the third. Gives a lot of strength. Right? It gives a lot of pride. It gives a lot of power. It gives a lot of determination and willpower. Now Rahu in the fourth. Murko. Veshmani. Dukkrit. Sasurit. Opayu kadachit suki. Dukkha krit sasurit. He's foolish. Murk. He causes problems for the family and friends. Dukkha krit sasurit. He's short lived. Alpayu and kadachit suki. A short term concept of happiness. That's why he's a murka, a fool. So the fourth house is the Surit Bhav, or it's the Sukha Bhav. It's the house for friendship, happiness, relationships, etc. The concept of Rahu in the fourth house, Rahu is expansive and unbalancing. So Rahu is changing things very rapidly. The fourth, it does not go at all with the fourth house, which is stabilizing. Enduring. So he says, Kadachitsuki, which means, so most people would just think it means sometimes he's happy. And they might actually rationalize it. Well, sometimes Rahu, Rahu flips back and forth. So sometimes happy, sometimes unhappy. Okay, that's one of the, that's one of the valid, connotations of the phrase kadachitsuki but kadachitsuki also means they just want to be happy for a minute the concept of happiness is very external remember also that is another clash between rahu and the fourth house rahu is extra extro a2 is intro rahu is extro fourth house is intro so that's another thing dynamic that's at work here is 
the concept of happiness is something that's very dependent upon external things and therefore very temporary or fleeting. Kadachitsuki. Takara! That's why Murk. Foolish. Dukkha Krit Sasurit. The fourth house is for the family. Rahu is wild. Doesn't follow rules, doesn't follow, etc. So you're putting Rahu in a place where there's rules and cooperation and causes problems for cooperation and family. All you people with Rahu in the fourth house who just want to say, God, this, this Vedic astrology hates me. I really am an idiot. I should go kill myself. No, this is, a let's say, a black dot in a recipe. You, ha you, as I said before, in case you just logged on, I'll repeat it again. In the classical book, the classical books are not written for everybody. Classical, bo classical books are written for the literate, which in those days meant the intelligent, the people who are already expert. So you are expected to know that this is a black color that is going to be mixed with the other colors and that the actual interpretation of the thing is a mixture of all these different ingredients. Rahu in the fifth, also no good. And I don't know really what this means, so I'll just quote it directly. Naso de advachano. Speaks from the nose. Nasal voice. But I don't understand this. And also, uh, maybe it has a connotation that means something that I'm not aware of. But so I'm just going to put it literally for now. Naso diad vachano suta katina rit rahau sute kukshirug. So speaks from the nose. Asuta doesn't have kids. Uh, makes sense. The fifth is the house of kids. Why don't they have a ton of kids? If Rahu is in the fifth, actually they may. You're thinking correctly. They may have a ton of kids, depending on how this color gets mixed. But Rahu is airy. It's it, it's Rahu is like a thing that blows up a balloon. So Rahu's. Uh, medical nature is vata. It's airy. Expands things. And in order to produce children, you need kappa, which is fleshiness or wateriness. So Rahu in the fifth house, it's not good for fertility, even though it looks like maybe it is. So if you're mixing it with other things that are Counter, counteracting that and really increasing kappa into the fifth house, then Rahu in the fifth house will do the exact opposite. We'll make lots of kids. Hard-hearted. Same thing, by the way. You have to be. You have, this is that will apply to every one of these interpretations we've just illustrated it with children. Hard-hearted. Fifth house is the house of love. Rahu is very hungry. Hunger is not conducive to love. Love, when you're loving, you feed people. When you're hungry, you eat. The Rahu is very hungry. It doesn't go well in a house which is lovey. So it makes Katina Rit a hard heart. Kukshiruk. I put, okay, so Kukshi. Kukshi rug means the abdominal cavity. So I'm going to change the way that this is written so that this thing that I'm going to explain now is more clear. But it means the abdominal illness and the abdominal cavity. Abdominal illness. But remember that because this is the house of kids, it could, what's inside your abdomen is also the womb. It can be affecting that as well. Or it can just be affecting your stomach. Rahu in the sixth. Dvit Krura Grahapidita. Saguda Rupach Rimans Chirayukshate. So again, he likes this. Here is one place that he loves Rahu. Put it in the third, he likes it. Put it in the sixth, he likes it. 
modest but fierce to enemies squeezing the squeezers quote hidden illness quote and long life all right so Sri monks means that he's modest but dvit krura but fierce to the enemy this is the ideal that you get when you get a good sixth house the sixth house is all about how you deal with enemies if your sixth house is all messed up then you're going to be treating your friends as if they were enemies like you'll be lashing out at your kids you'll be lashing out at your spouse you'll be lashing out at your parents and wimping out with your boss or wimping out with your rival wimping out with the bully if your sixth house is bad if your sixth house is good then you'll be soft and gentle with your kids your spouse your parents friends and tough as nails with the bully with the boss with the tax man with every with everybody else so that's what he's saying he likes Rao in the sixth house so it puts strength into the sixth house and when strength is in the sixth house you get that effect you get gentility to the to the gentle but squeezing the squeezers graha pirita graha pirita literally means to squeeze the squeezer graha means something that grabs and pirita means something that squeezes so if if you've been familiar with this channel for a long time then you remember the ardra nakshatra videos or whatever maybe you've just recently watched that that's the whole theme of the ardra nakshatra as well is to hunt the hunter to squeeze the squeezer it's the same concept if you put strength in the sixth house that's what you get you get healthy anger healthy force healthy aggression aggression which is used against aggress aggressors anger which is used against injustice saguda rupach means hidden illness so again that's in quotes because he says chirayu long life so depending on how the thing mixes with the rest of the chart maybe it means the disease will be very unclassifiable because the sixth house is about disease and rahu is mysterious and invisible so it may mean that if things line if other things line up poorly for the sixth house but if everything is if in a void where it's only rahu in the sixth house then it means you won't see illness which again you, even that kind of phraseology you can see maybe it sneaks up on you but the primary meaning is you won't see it it's not there because it's long life all right so we got a break we got rahu in, in a good house for a second and now we're back to the grindstone rahu in the seventh stri samgat adano made taviduro virya Swatantro Padir spends everything on sex. So it, um, it's also illustrating to you something which is kind of lost in modern astrology. It's not just the eighth house that's about sex. It's the seventh and even the fifth. So the fifth is the loving side. This, the eighth is like the purely hormonal side just the drives and the impulse to reproduce so it's like that biological motivator is in the eighth emotional motivator is in the fifth but the seventh house is the actual intercourse and interaction with each other so that's why the name for the seventh house used in this text right now is mother which means infatuation which means romance if Rahu is there it's going to be excessive so they so he says he's losing his money by spending it all in the pursuit of sex and Vidura means wanton it's not Vidura it's Vidura different word a different letter it makes a different word Avirya no power but Swatantro. So this is a, might as well put these two words together. 
Avirya Svatantra. Independent but powerless. The con that's the concept. Why would you spend all your money on sex? Because you're not settling down on having a, a, a consistent sexual relationship. That's where I'm in the seventh house. A lot of partners. Why are you not settling down? Because you want to be Swatantra, independent. You don't want to cooperate. You don't want to compromise. You want what you want, and that's it. Swatantra, you want to do it your way. And then get out the door. Avirya, this becomes your weakness. This is why you're drained of money and everything, because you refuse to cooperate. Because you want to be strong and independent, you've actually made yourself weak. So that's the kind of thing that you need to talk about when you see Rao in the third, seventh house. And the Alpadi means low concentration. So very distracted because of the wantonness or the high hunger. The seventh house is to do with Mada, which is your infatuation. Rao is very hungry, so it's going to become excessive. You understand? Oh my God, this is doom and gloom. Again, just going to repeat. This is a book written many centuries ago when the only people who would have been able to read it would be people who are experienced and understand things well. So you as a reader are expected to be at that level when you read a classical book. You are expected to already know that Rahu in the seventh house is one part of a multi, multi, multi part picture. And it has to blend and balance with everything else. Hence, the author of the classical book doesn't spend a chapter describing Rao in the seventh house and all the possible nuances of it, because the reader can do that. But in today's world, your, your books and astrology are like, here's a chapter on the sun in Aries. Here's a chapter on the sun in Taurus. Here's a chapter on the sun in Gemini. You know, the, the classical author would have been like, why, why, why would you waste your time with that? Like, the reader knows how to do that. So he's just giving Rahu the seventh in one statement because he expects that you're reading the rest of the book as well and figuring it all out. All right. Rahu the eighth. He's not going to be happy with this one either. Rantrail Palyur Asuti Kritcha Vikalo Vatamayo. Bajat Maja. Short lived, unclean, troubled, exhausted, Avata type, and few children. So, same thing with Rao in the fifth as far as how it affects children. Here he explains that it's Vata Maya. That's what I explained about Rao in the fifth. You need Kappa for children, Rao is Vata. Vikala, exhausted. You're getting the eighth house is the hormone generator. <clears throat> so if the eighth house is strong, you're going to have a steady hormonal constitution, which means that you're... Not, it's not just about libido, but it's also about the rest of your mood and the rest of your interest in life in general will be steady. But if the hormone balance is too fluctuating, then you get exhausted. That's what happens when Rao is in the 8th house. That kind of exhaustion. Kritcha, troubled. And Ashudi, unclean. So they're not going to be careful about the 8th house. The 8th house is, the, is that area of your body where you need to be clean. Alpayur lower lifespan again it's the same thing with kids if you get the right combination of stuff with Rao in the 8th house it might mean a very long lifespan and I already explained why in the 5th so I don't want to do it again but um, if it's just Rahu in the 8th in a vacuum then you're getting unsteadiness in the life production force the life force production which is the hormone and so this actually exhausts the body and makes it dry out and then flood up and then dry out and then flood up and that wears it out fast. Okay, Rahu in the ninth. 
this one he puts it as yellow now here's where well even with the fifth house actually let's save this for k2 when we get to k2 we're going to start to scratch our head about how can this since k2 is always seven away from rahu how can this be so let's save that for k2 but let's look at rahu in the ninth now dharmashte pratikulavak ganapura grama dipo punyavan argumentative which means heterodox immoral leader of a group city or village so if it's in the house of dharma dharmasta if it's if it's in that house of dharma then pratikulva Prat, pratikul cool means cool kula means agreeable or together with pratikul means against the togetherness vak means they will preach against the togetherness so they will preach against the dharma the thing that unites people they'll preach preach against the normal way that people normally relate with each other do you understand that the thought process is simple rahu is not asura rahu is an asura but here it is in the dharma bhava rahu in other words let's take it out of the mythological wording rahu is wild wild doesn't go well with rules ninth house is religion ninth house is rules so wild clashing with rules means heterodox Pratikulavak. And Apunyavan. Immoral. Same thought process. And then Ganapura Gramadipo. But there's, it's not all bad when Rao is in the ninth. Grana, Ganapura Gramadipo means the leader of a group, city, or village. So Rahu in the ninth symbolizes the kind of person who speaks a against the norms and becomes powerful by by that so it's medium good rahu in the 10th pasuto anyakarya nirata satkarma Anyakarya nirata satkarma hino abhagya. Extroverted. Rao in the tenth. Kyata. Very loud. And kyata also means extroverted. Loud means you got attention. So it means famous or well known. K in the sky, in the tenth house. Kyata k alpasuta, not that many kids. Why with the tenth house? Too airy. Constitution is too airy. Too much vata. Also, not settled. Anyakarya nirata, obsessed with others. What does that mean? I'm not so sure, so I just put it in quotes. Anyakarya nirata, always doing the stuff that other people do, or always looking at what other people do. Satkarma hino, doing your own responsibilities, not. Abaya, having no fear about that. Being very bold, kind of angels rushing in, uh, fools rushing in where angels fear to tread. Rahu is that. Rahu in the tenth is that, but can pull it off. So it's me, not totally bad, not really great either to have Rahu in the tenth. One strong thing about it is fame becomes likely. Rahu in the eleventh, however, he loves it. Srimanati Suttas Chirayu Rasure Labhe Sakarnamaya sort of. I mean it is Rahu, so beautiful. Rahu in the eleventh, beautiful, wealthy. Beautiful or wealthy, Sriman. Blessed, you can say. Lucky. Na'atisutas. You have kids. 
but not too many. Asure uh, Labe means Rahu in the 11th. Sakarna Maya. Sakarna Amaya. The wording is also obscure. Maybe has great hearing, but prob maybe has bad hearing. Hearing loss. This is simple. The 11th, 11th and 3rd have to do with your ears. 2nd and 12th have to do with your eyes. Maybe nose. Remember that thing we didn't know about nose? But nose, I would think, is 7th. Maybe 7th is teeth. I don't know. These days, when you actually have doctors, it's not really that important to learn. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Medical astrology might be quite important. All right, now Rahu in the 12th. Prachanagarato. Bohu vyaya paro ripe. Amburuk pidida. Interested in hiding ill deeds. I think there's some famous people. Oh, I, I think there might be some famous politicians with Rahu in the 12th. Interested in hiding ill deeds. Many expensive deeds. Suffering from Kappa disorder. I just have to look this up. One second. Planet Ra, the node, let's say, in the house 12. No, didn't get anybody on my list. Wait, that's, yeah, that's Ra in 12. Hmm. Anyway, I'm not going to make any contentious statements. This is also thing, something that I really don't like. Because in astrology, you are expected to know the blends and how to blend things. Because that's a fact. It's very easy to be abusive and insultive using astrology. Like I can say, I can look at, I can find your chart and all of a sudden I'll see that Rahu is in one of these red houses. Good, highly likely that it is, right? And then I can just blaspheme you. Completely ignoring, considering how that aspect of the chart matches with everything else. I can just say, look, the person is a complete liar and a thief. Because they have Rahu in the 12th. But just in the same way that I explained that Rahu in the 5th house, you may have 100 kids. Because the reason why Rahu, even though the text says you don't have kids, the reason is because Rahu is Vata. But the other thing about Rahu is that Vata, or Vata, Vata makes a lot, makes things expand. So if you also mix it with things putting Kappa on the fifth house, then you're not going to get no kids, you're going to get tons of kids. But that same sophistication in how you have to think about Rahu in the fifth house, how it affects kids, you have to think about Rahu in every house, every planet in every house, and how it symbolizes everything. Anything. Okay, now that's Rahu. Now, let's continue. We're going to do an extended session today. Because we want to do Rahu and Ketu at the same time. Because I feel like it's important to see how they... What if YouTube turned off like a million years ago? So, I, I think it's important to see them at the same time. Because there's this weird thing that I mentioned. The, the thing about Rahu and Ketu is, well, they're... The, you, I mean, what they are is the point where the moon crosses the ecliptic, or where the moon crosses the sun's path. So because the moon is inclined towards the sun, and they both go in circular orbits, that means the moon's going to cross the sun twice. Coming up, and then going down. Coming up is Rahu, crossing going down is Ketu. So those two points then are on the two sides of the moon's orbit. So those two points are always 180 degrees apart. But just the reason why they move is because the Earth is moving. And they move slowly because, because of the Earth's motion, the place where the moon is going to cross the sun's path gradually moves. Um, but they're always 180 degrees apart. So that means 
that if you know that Rahu is in the first house, then you also know that Ketu is in the seventh. If you know that Rahu is in the second, then you already know that Rahu is in that. If you know that Rahu is in the second, then you already know that Ketu is in the eighth. If Rahu is in the third, then Ketu has to be in the ninth. No matter what house system you use. Yeah, no matter what house system you use of any house system that I know of. Because they're exactly 180 degrees apart. So, one would expect that Mantreshwar would have taken that into account so that the interpretation that he gives for K2 in the 7th is conformant with the interpretation that he gave for Rahu in the 1st, etc. But he doesn't. And that was bumming me out for a while. But it presents an interesting, there's a very interesting solution to it, which is very enlightening about how astrology ch interpretations of charts actually work. And now we'll mention that solution at the end of Kate Two's interpretations. So first, let's just see what we're solving before we solve it. Now, also, let me put Kate Two's color map up. Probably should have did this already. It is almost exactly like Rahu's. Practically, it's exactly the same in terms of what houses it looks good in. But therein is the problem. Because if you have Ra Rahu is good in the third house, but that means K2 is in the ninth, and he doesn't like K2 in the ninth. Well, I thought it was good to have a node in the third house, but if I have a node in the third house, that means I have a node in the ninth house. Same thing with the 11th. If I have a node in the 11th, then it means I have the other node in the 5th. Same thing with the 6th. I have a node in the 6th, and it means I have the other one in the 12th. Well, it's good to have a node in the 6th, but it's not good to have it in the 12th. It's good to have it in the 3rd, but it's not good to have it in the 9th. It's good to have it in the 11th, but it's not good to have it in the 5th. So how does that work? We'll resolve that, uh, that um, conundrum at the end of the session today. And also, you see this pattern that they have? This is the Ra Rahu, what was it? Shanivad Rahu Kujav Kujavad Ketu. That's what this means. Because let me show you. Let me just show you that, illustrate that for you right now. This is Rahu and Ketu. That's Saturn. How different is it? How different is it? 3, 6, 11, exactly the same. Saturn is better in 10 than Rahu and Ketu are. And then these iffy middly houses are a little bit different. And that's Mars. How different is Mars from Saturn? Very not. And even the Sun. All the three malefics, they follow this basic pattern. And then I'm disconnected and reconnecting. Reconnection is successful. You know, I think maybe my adapter is going bad. Yeah, K2 is against us, of course. K2, please. Okay. K2 in the first. Lagne kritagnam asukam pishunam vivanam stana chitam vikala dehana sat samajam. Ungrateful, unhappy, malicious, loss of place, imperfect body in the company of Asat people. If Kuja is in the first house, Kritagna. Kritagna means that you don't acknowledge what other people do. That's what it means. So it's ungrateful, but also not acknowledging others. Asuk, unhappy. Ketu's nature is withdrawn. If K2 is in the first house, you'll withdraw. Let me explain one thing that's important that I've explained 700 times already. But since this is YouTube, people join not at the beginning. So a person like me who's used to teaching a regular class kind of freaks out about that. Um, you're expected to mix these ingredients with the rest of the ingredients to get the actual picture. 
So just to illustrate this, there's a very happy person who has Ketu in the first house. His name is Krishna. So, and he's also not exactly Kritagnam or Pishunam. But you see, it's actually very useful not just to look at the poster child of a placement. Like you could find, and actually, who would be the biggest poster child for the, these descriptions of Rahu and Ketu? Really, what I think you can look at the, the, I don't know if it's Jeffrey Dahmer, but most of the guys that I have in my list, like the really bad people, Richard Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, Richard Ramirez, there's other people, whatever their names are. They all, of Charles Manson, these guys, they have like moon right on Rahu, moon right on K2. The effect of K that Rahu and K2 have so intensified. You know, it's useful to look up a poster child like that and say, look, here's a malicious, ungrateful, unhappy person, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it's also very useful to look up the person that doesn't match. Here's Krishna. He's got K2 in the first house. Because that teaches you how to do the blend. When you find a person who's a poster child for a particular placement, it just means that everything else in that recipe was saying the same thing that this ingredient. Everything else, you put this recipe had sugar in it, and everything else was like sugar. And so, damn, this recipe came out really sweet. Just the way sugar is supposed to. That's what happens when you have somebody like, I don't know, like Oprah Winfrey's chart. Everything is very obvious. Everything fits in the same way. Um, yeah, but when you have somebody like Krishna with the K2 in the first house, then you have to think, what happens when you mix this with the, with the first Lord being in its own house in a Raja Yoga? What happens when this is being aspect, or when the when this is with the exalted moon, which is exalted in like a million different amshas, etc., etc., etc. All right, loss of place, vivanam, ah, stana chutam, vivanam. I don't, don't even really know how to translate. Stana Chutam, loss, loss of the place. So it's similar to Ra Rahu in the first house. He was talking about Avachirayur. Rahu's nature will be to expand something until it gets unbalanced and falls. K2 is going to have the same effect in the opposite way. Its nature is to make something so small that it creates imbalance and then it falls. It causes the system to go unbalanced. So K2 is pulling away from stuff. And then by pulling something out, everything falls down. Loss of the place, loss of the status. You can definitely see that in Krishna. Loss of status, he was supposed to be the king. He wound up a farmer. Loss of status. Uh, vikala deham. So vikala can mean imperfect body, but vikala can mean very special body as well. So again, it has to do with how you configure the rest of the chart with this thing just like with rahu in the fifth house you might see a hundred kids you might see zero kids but you probably don't see two or one maybe you can maybe you can it all depends on the the blend um same thing with ketu in the first house maybe they have a messed up body maybe they have an amazing body depends because ketu is making something so unique that's really what Vikala means. Unique or different. Asat Samaj. You hang out with low-class people. You hang out with Ketus. Ketu in the second. Vidyartha Hinam Adamokti Yuktam Kudrishtim Pata Prana Niratam Kurute Dhanasta Without study. Vidyartha Hinam. Without study. Second house is the house for studies. Ill spoken, Atamokti. Harsh eyes, Kudrishti. 
Likes to eat others' food. Pata Parana Nirata. Independent. That means dependent. Okay. And we're going to try to finish up. Hopefully, you, most of you guys were here from the beginning, so you know how these things can be explained. Ayur Balam Dhana Yashap. Pramadana Sokyam. Ketau Tritiya Bhavane. The first time. One of the few times where they name a house by their number. Tritiya Bhavane. In the third house, Sahaja Pranasham. Enjoying health. So he loves it. Having strength, enjoying health, strength, strength, wealth, reputation, love, and food, destroying competitors or siblings. Just like Rahu in the third house, just like Mars in the third house, just like Saturn in the third house, just like Sun in the third house, the classical astrologers love it. They love to put strong, excessive, malefic planets in the third house. A great generates great effects if you don't know why we talked about it with Rahu in the sixth house in this very stream so later on go and watch it if you really want to know uh good k2 in the fourth probably not great right Bhukshetrayana janani sukha janmal bhumi na shamsuke paragrihas titim evadatte loss of items of comfort such as land, vehicles, mother, and homeland, very dependent on the home of another. If it's not obvious, then it will be soon. The more that you learn the very basics of astrology, like what the fourth house is about and what K2 is. K2 in the fifth, Putrakshaya, Jatraroga, Pshachapidam, Reduces children. Putrakshaya. Reduction of children. Diminution of children. Jatararoga. Stomach disease. Pshachapidam. You're troubled by devils. That's weird. Why Ketu in the fifth house? Pshachapidam. This actually means mental illness. Now, does it make sense? The fifth house is the intellect. So, K2 in the fifth, mm, mental illness is likely. If you line up everything the right way, you may have extremely incisive intellect with intuition and ESP and extrasensory perception. But if everything is just equal and it's only k2 in the fifth house nothing else is affecting it you have evil spirits in your mind such pedam durbutim same thing the intellect doesn't function very well admani kala prakritim kala prakriti have a hard nature same was rahu in the fifth house right it was forget the exact word but it meant hard-hearted I want to know. Rahu in the fifth. Katina rid. Hard hearted. K2 in the sixth, he's going to like it again, and it's so interesting how and why. Audarya mutta magunam dridatam prasidam saste prabhutam arimad arnam ishta siddhim. Merciful, merciful. K2 can make you merciful. This is the same thing Rahu in the sixth made, and we explained it. So please watch it so that we don't have to explain it again. Rewatch it. The same principle is going on here. When you put strength where strength belongs, then you become strong with people you should be strong with, and you become gentle with people you should be gentle with. Oh, Dariam, Uttamaguna, excellent character. Dridhatam prasidam. Prasidhim means great success. Great success. Uh, prasidhi. And it also means like the renown from the success. And dridhatam means it endures. So enduring success, enduring fame. Ketu makes things very compacted. Lordship, prabhutva. 
conquering enemies, Adi Madaranam. And Ishta City. Ishta City is almost like a yogic power. Um, we, means the ability to fulfill your desires. So it's almost like a mystical ability to fulfill your desires. So, K2 and 6, fantastic. K2 and the 3rd, fantastic. But well, Rahu in the 12th is not great. And Rahu in the 9th was not the best. It was weird. Because if K2 is in the 6th, Rahu has to be in the 12th. And if K2 is in the 3rd, Rahu has to be in the 9th. How can it be so great? Rahu in the 9th, actually, look at this. Rahu in the 9th was supposed to be Adharmi. Heterodoxical. Immoral. But K2 in the 3rd was supposed to be really... Moral? Good reputation, loving. Uh, K2 in the 6th, excellent character. Rahu in the 12th likes to hide ill deeds. But if K2 is in the 6th, Rahu must be in the 12th. This is bumming me out. <laughs> For a while. But it, the solution to it is very interesting. So we'll get to it in a sec. K2 in the seventh, probably not great. Indeed, Dune Vamanam Asati Ratim Antra Rogam Pata Svadara Vyutim Madadhatu Hanim. Disrespected. Unsteady passion. Asati Rati. Unsteady passion also means passion for unworthy things. Asati rog, uh, rati means passion for un, unworthy things, and it also means unsteady passion. And it also means, see, this is so interesting because the, all the things that this could possibly mean, the words encompass the things that could possibly happen depending on how K2 is configured with the rest of things in the seventh house. So it could mean unsteady passion, it could mean passion for undeserving things it could also mean passionless it doesn't exist asati rati can mean your passion doesn't exist antarogam internal disease especially bowel separation from the beloved without a beauty makes sense seventh house in k2 and then Dhatu Hani means without minerals. So I don't really know exactly what's that connotating, but it could mean ill health or it could mean no money. Dhatu can mean like gold. K2 in the eighth, nope, he doesn't like it. Although he might have suspected that it might be good. Swapayurishta viraham kalaham charandre shastra kshatam sakalakarya virodham eva. Short lived, without inspiration or motivation, injured by a weapon, frustrated in all undertakings. So, again, the eighth house is what's giving the hormone. It's the source of hormone. And the hormone is what's giving the drive and the motivation. So with K2, it's reductive on the hormone production. So you're not going to have drive. You're not going to have inspiration. Ishtaviraham. That's what that means. Shastra Kshatam means you get injured by a weapon. It also means you don't like to follow rules. And then sakalakarya virodam, you get frustrated by anything you try to do. It has to do with not really the frustration is you don't have enough drive. So everything seems like don't really want to be doing this. Everything seems frustrated. Hey, to in the ninth, one would wish that it would be good because not only does one have K2 in the ninth, but also because Rahu is supposed to be good in the third. And if I was in the third K2, it's got to be in the ninth. So here he says, Papa 
Tam Ashubam Pitri Bhagyahinam Daridra Marya Janat Ushana Mahadarmi. <clears throat> An inauspicious, socially harmful means of income. Papa Pravitta. Ashubam. Pravritti means the way that you're earning money. Why is it with the ninth house how you're earning money, not the eleventh? The ninth house is also how you affect society, really. The ninth house is how you affect society. So your pravritti, your, and it's all related to the tenth. Eleventh and ninth are related to the tenth. Tenth is the center of the upper portion of the sky, and eleven and nine get their meaning from it. So the career is tenth, and then pravritti usually comes on the eleventh, but the ninth is the other echo of it, how it affects the world. The Papa Pravritti Mashub, you make money, but the society doesn't really benefit from it. Actually, I could see that. I have K2 in the ninth. I can see an echo of that because I like living in Japan, but I have no customers. I don't serve anybody here. Everybody is on the internet that, that I do. And I'm this weird tax situation where I pay taxes to America, but I live in Japan, etc. So I can see that. Bhagyahinam without a uh, pitri bhagyahinam means your forefathers weren't there or you gave up your culture and you didn't get cultured. Daridraya unfortunate and then Marya Jana Ushana. You speak against the people who follow rules. Can, I can also see that. Okay, that's K2 in the ninth. K2 in the tenth, man, it's also not so great, but it's a little bit okay. Sat karma vignam asuchitvam avadyakrityam tejasvinam. That's one good thing. Nabasi shoryam, another good thing. Ati precede him. This is another good thing. So. Maybe this should be blue, but the thing that is bad is Sat Karma Vigna. Unless. Yeah, I can't find any way to, to read this some other way. Sat Karma Vigna means obstructing good deeds. And then unclean, ungrateful, but very successful. Powerful and bold. So the it's kind of indicative of the people who, who kind of get success but aren't really necessarily the nicest people. K2 and the eleventh, he loves it. Labherta sam chayam aneka gunam subogam satravya sopakaranam sakalarta sidhim saves wealth, saves wealth. 11th house is your luxury. K2 is reductive. So you, K2 is in the 11th house. But remember, Upachaya is great for these kind of planets like K2. K2 in the 11th is going to have a good spin to it. And that spin will come out and you save money. You don't spend frivolously. Saves wealth, many good qualities, enjoys well. Sadravya Sopakarna means has good resources and good tools for Sakalartha Siddhi. To accomplish all the aspirations. So he loves it. But he didn't like Rahu in the fifth. And then finally, Ketu in the twelfth also doesn't like it. Also, a lot like Rahu in the twelfth. Pratchana papa madama vyayamartha nasham. Ripe viruta gatim akshirujam chapata. Secret immorality. So, kind of like, exactly like Rahu in the twelfth. Debased, Adhama. Squandering wealth, Artanash. Oppositional, Virudha. Oppositional, Virudha Gati and Akshi Ruja. You got uh, vision problems. So, Rahu, as far as the health stuff goes, Rahu Ketun first is affecting the brain in the um, fifth. Uh, well, let's go in order. And the second is affecting the face or the appearance in the but yeah and the second is affecting the face of the appearance but it can also be the eyesight and the 12th also especially the eyesight 
In the third, he pretty much loves it, so he doesn't say anything bad. But it can also affect hearing, because in the eleventh, it also can affect hearing. And those two are the ears. Fourth, he just had illness in general. Fifth, he talks about children, reproduction, abdomen. Sixth, he loves it. Seventh, he talks about the bowels. Eighth, it's a, how it affects the hormones. So that's how the disease works. All right. So we went over Rahu and Ketu and all the 12 houses, but how do we resolve this problem? Let me see if I can show you a practical example. Uno momento. Hmm. It's not a particularly great practical example. How do you resolve the problem? Why is it? Okay, so to give you a coming attraction to the next two verses, he's going to say you have to understand that not every planet in every house produces its effect loudly. This is one of the things that you have to bear in mind when you combine ingredients in a recipe is how much salt. Recipe A has a salt and sugar. Recipe B has salt and sugar. Recipe A might be 10 cups of salt and one pinch of sugar, and recipe B may be one pinch of salt and 10 cups of sugar. So he's going to bring that up in the next two verses, and he's going to say, yeah, you have to realize that not every planetary placement is equally loud. And he's going to give away, figure out how loud it is. And I've already told it to you so many times, it has to do with the ascendant degree and how the planet aligns with the ascendant degree in whatever house it's in. And then he says, and then he, this is coming right after Rahu Ketu, and then after he makes that statement, he says, Rahu Vachani Kujavat Ketu is something that many people say. So he still has Rahu and Ketu on his mind when he's bringing this point up. So if you dwell on that, it can pr produce the solution. Not exactly, because they're exactly 180 degrees apart. So, f so for example, if you have an ascendant at uh, 12 degrees, and you have a planet at 12 degrees, it doesn't have to be in the same sign. But that planet that's at 12 degrees is going to be very impactful on whatever house that it's in because of the fact that it is actually sitting at the door of the house it's on the cusp of the house the traditional old cusp not the placidius cusp or anything um right so bear that in mind so if you have rahu at if you have an ascendant at five degrees and you have rahu at five degrees that rahu is very impactful so, but if you have Rahu at five degrees of any sign, then you then K two is also at five degrees of any sign, guaranteed, because they're exactly one hundred and eighty degrees apart. So that doesn't solve the problem for us. I was the problem can be the problem can be be solved by realizing that Rahu or K two are not equally dominant in anybody's chart. One may be more dominant than the other. So for in this issue where, for example, Rahu is good in the third. But if Rao is in the third, K2 is in the ninth, and K2 is not so great in the ninth. In resolving that issue, you want to say which one is more dominant. If Rahu in the third is more dominant than K2 in the ninth, then you don't focus much on K2 being in the ninth. The main thing is Rahu in the third. K2 in the ninth just gives some echo or permutation of whatever it represents. Or vice versa. If K2 in the ninth is a dominant one, then Ra in the third is just flavoring the main thing, which is based on K2 in the ninth. So the way to figure that out is how many planets are, are they aligned with, are they um, involved with? In a chart where Rahu is conjoined with everything and K2 is nothing, or everything is aspecting Rahu and nothing is aspecting K2 then it's all on the Rahu interpretation and zero on the K2. All right? So that is the answer to that conundrum.
again, the disclaimer is I am reading a book to you. This is a book which I feel is, this is my favorite classical astrology book. I basically not only agree with everything in this book, but this book is basically the foundation for everything that I know about astrology. But it doesn't mean that this is exactly my opinion. I'm just sharing with you this person's opinion. Exactly the way this person wrote it, Montreshwar. Um, so that's one disclaimer. I might not... Well, you know, the way that I explain Rahu and Ketu, I always take it into account. That if Rahu is in the first house, Ketu is definitely in the seventh. So however you explain Rahu in the first should take into account that, Rahu, that Ketu is in the seventh, etc., etc. That's the way I would do it. That doesn't mean everybody has to do it that way. That's not the way Montreshwar does it. But if you do have very different interpretations, the way that that works is that is in the way I just explained. You realize that not Rahu and Ketu are not equally dominant. And that is a very good technique to do it that way. All right, I have a little... Um, Attention span left? I have a little though. If you have a really interesting question, I can, I can answer it or reply to it. Zeno, would you look at Rahu in the fifth alone, but Ketu conjunct Venus in the 11th? Would you view the Rahu being alone or would you take Venus into account? I'm asking what you would personally do. That's odd that you would say that because actually that's my situation. I have Rao in the third, K2 in the ninth with Venus. Thing is, you just have to know your mechanics. Always remember that actually all of the work, everything that you really need to learn, you learn in kindergarten. Everything that you really need to know, you learn in, the, in elementary school. The rest of the stuff that you learn in junior high and high school and college is just based on the stuff that you learned in elementary. This is the same thing with astrology. You just have to know how to figure out an aspect, how to figure out a conjunction, and then you can answer these questions. If Venus is at a particular... You know, what's the angle between Venus and Rahu, and what's the distance between Venus and K2? All those things are important. What sign, who's ruling what? You have to actually be able to do the mechanics. And then you can figure out what's being influenced by what. Thank you, Umbra. AC says, honestly, with K2, it depends on how many are planets to interact with. I would say with Rahu as well. They're entirely dependent on how many of your planets they interact with. Yeah, I see what you're saying. More than more than being on the cusp? Mm. Yeah, I might agree with you. Talk about Rahu K2 Raja Yoga. Why? It's off topic. Are aspects on Rahu and K2 more helpful than the same planet being conjunct with them? one could definitely present a convincing argument in favor of that. And the reason is that an aspect is visual inf influence from a distance, but conjunction is physical contact. So by aspecting something, for example, Jupiter aspecting Rahu can influence Rahu. It's influencing Rahu, but not being very influenced by Rahu. But Jupiter can join with Rahu. It's also influencing Rahu, but Rahu is also influencing it. Does Mars get along well with K2? Or is it too much aggression in the 6th? If Mars is, and K2 are in the 6th, it should be very good. I would like to see that person understand that chart. But that this is because Mars is very well in the 6th and K2 does very well in the 6th. You also, of course, have to understand the sign. But Mars and K2 elsewhere, it would be like a double K2. 
So in all the spots where K2 is red, it would be worse with Ra. It would be worse with, with Mars. I meant to say Rahu. You meant to say Rahu. Who meant to say Rahu? Oh no. No, I am... Um... Mars with Rahu? Well, same answer. Mars does well in the sixth. Rahu does well in the sixth. But Mars with Rahu or K2 is tricky. Be careful because Rahu and K2 amplify things. And Mars is fire and explosion. explosion. So keep an eye on it. The video is about Rahu and Ketu in the houses. What would I say about Rahu, Ketu, Raj Yogas? Put, if you put Rahu or Ketu in a trine with a, with a Kendra Lord, then it's a Raj Yoga. Or if you put Rahu or Ketu in a Kendra with a trine Lord, then it's Raj Yoga. Can Rahu be the search for Amrit in a house? I mean, that's pretty poetic. Rajadam Das. A lot of books and videos that I have seen have always said that K2 in the 12th is good for moksha. I'm surprised that's not mentioned here. That's correct. It's not mentioned here. You can also say K2, especially in the 8th, maybe it's very good for spirituality. Doesn't mean that it's wrong, but it wasn't what Mantreshwar wanted to teach people about Rahu in the 12th or K2 in the 12th, etc. All right, guys. Don Woodhouse. Oh, that's... Okay. Too many questions. Sorry, I can't keep up. Someday we'll just do uh, only questions and any questions topic, uh, a stream. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the birthday. Happy birthdays.